You're listening to The Dr. Cremata Show, empowering you to master healthy living by bringing you the latest research, expert interviews, and quick, easy tips you can incorporate into your daily life. The Dr. Cremata Show, not your ordinary health show. Whoa! I feel good. I knew that I wouldn't. I feel good. I knew that I wouldn't. So good. So good. I got a year. Good morning and welcome to the show. We have a great show for you today packed with a lot of very important health information. Our guest is Dr. DeBold, who has a doctoral degree in public health and is an expert on vaccinations. We'll look at some of the recent studies in the news about the flu vaccine and some very important information about the removal of a recommendation for a child's vaccine. You'll become the only one among your friends that will know about micropsia, and you'll be able to justify, with science, the reason for getting that dog that you've been wanting just for the health of it. And who has seen the story on the Internet about deaths from taking vitamin C with shrimp? We'll look at that today in our medical myths section. Let's start with the science about dog ownership. Dr. Mercola of Mercola.com <clears throat> excuse me, reviewed some literature regarding the health effects of dog ownership. There's really quite a bit of scientific data about the benefits of owning a dog. If you're a dog owner, you already know about the special joys that they bring to your life, but the benefits are so much more even than that. Dogs have been proven to be good for your health in many ways. This is why dogs are brought into hospitals and convalescent homes as therapy to help patients heal. And it's actually been shown that people on Medicare and Medicaid have fewer doctor visits uh, when they own a dog. Studies have also shown that as far as psychological factors are concerned, pet ownership was ranked number one in determining a patient's likelihood of long-term survival after a heart attack. Studies have also shown that dogs can help to lower blood pressure by reducing stress. So you might be wondering, just how does a dog do all that? <clears throat> well, there's the constant unconditional love, devotion, and friendship. Everyone who owns or has owned a dog knows what I'm talking about. They make us laugh. Uh, they give us a reason to get up, even on those mornings that we don't feel like it. They get us exercising when we take them on their walks. They provide a source of touch, and they help us cope with illness, loss, and depression. It's no surprise that all of these things have been proven to improve your health. Research has also shown that petting a dog for just a few minutes causes our bodies to release serotonin, prolactin, and oxytocin, and these are hormones produced that uh, essentially make us feel good. So be sure to give your dog some extra scratching today, maybe even another biscuit at bedtime. If you're considering getting a dog, please call your local Humane Society and make sure you talk to them to see if owning a dog is the right choice for you at this time. In one of the most prestigious journals uh, in medicine, uh, Lancet, in August of 2008, researchers studied the presumed protective effects of the flu vaccine in a healthy elderly population of 3,500 people. So over a three-year period, they compared a group of people that got the vaccine to a group that didn't to see if the flu vaccine had a protective effect on vaccinated people getting pneumonia from the flu. Now, keep in mind that one of the reasons for recommending the flu vaccine is to theoretically prevent a more dangerous complication of the flu, pneumonia. Now, their conclusion, and I quote, the effect of influenza vaccination on the risk of pneumonia in elderly people during influenza season might be less than previously estimated. Uh, close quotes. Um, you will find here pretty soon that that is a, uh, uh, you know, a, a very uh, gross underestimation of the actual. Essentially, two researchers from the United States Center of Disease Control and Prevention reviewed this study and reported two very important things. Number one. During the flu season, the vaccine effectiveness to prevent pneumonia was actually a negative 4%. Now, that means exactly what it says, folks. It means that the people that that the people in the vaccine group, the ones that got the vaccine, um, actually ended up developing more pneumonia by just a little bit than those that didn't get the vaccine. And number two, they found that this study gives different conclusions in previous studies. So while prior studies showed some benefit from using the flu vaccine to prevent pneumonia, 
These Center for Disease Control and Prevention researchers found that the different findings in this study were because this study was better done and it controlled for more variables. So bottom line here is don't assume that the flu vaccine will be effective to prevent the complications of the flu and specifically pneumonia. Remember that the prevention of pneumonia complications from the flu is a major reason for recommending the flu vaccine. So even when the flu vaccine is effective for preventing the flu, it likely offers uh, really a very tiny benefit. The next article, which is related, is in a journal called Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, and this came out in May of 2008. They reported that the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices concluded that routine vaccination with the meningitis vaccine is not recommended, and I repeat, not recommended, for children 2 to 10 years old. This recommendation to not use the vaccine is based on various factors such as safety, immunogenicity data, and the epidemiology of the disease. Remember, whenever we're going to recommend a vaccine or remove a recommendation, we have to do a risk-benefit analysis. And when the benefit starts looking less than the risks, we have to go back and say, hey, at least in this age group where we have the studies, let's remove that recommendation. So if your child's pediatrician routinely recommends the meningitis vaccine and your child or grandchild is between 2 and 10 years of age, you might want to update your doctor on the science regarding this recommendation prior to making any decision about consenting to your child having the meningitis machine. I'm sorry, vaccine. Does thinking make us fatter? Well, in the September 2008 journal, Professor, Professor Temblay at the University of Laval noticed that he craved chocolate chip cookies every time he worked up a grant application. So he performed some studies in his lab showing that mental work destabilizes the levels of insulin and glucose, two critical components in the body's regulatory and energy machinery, and that this essentially stimulated his appetite. So they pointed out that the brain uses only glucose for energy, unlike muscles, which use fat and glucose. So according to the research, participants consumed far more calories after performing mental tasks than they consumed after relaxing for the same period of time. Specifically, they consumed 24% more calories during reading and 30% more calories during computer work, as opposed to when they rested. These authors claim that the shift in jobs to computer-based activities might be a contributor to our country's weight problem since uh, these activities increase our appetite. They say that many college professors are fat and that perhaps the skinny ones uh, use their computers on the treadmill. Let's go to our weird medicine segment and let's look at micropsia. Now, this is a condition in which objects appear much smaller than they really are. The sufferers describe things as being far away yet very close, such as uh, they see their dog, which is right in front of them, look the size of a mouse. Now, people have also described as if they were looking through the wrong end of a telescope. There are several causes of this disease, this uh, micropsia. It can be the result of a psychological disorder in which people want to shrink their world in order to make it appear less threatening. It can also be caused by a problem with the retina in the eye resulting in distortion. And, of course, it can be brought on by certain psychoactive drugs such as cannabis or magic mushrooms, as they are called. The most common cause of micropsia, however, is an actual neurological disorder, which affects visual uh, perception. It's uh, time for a short break. If you missed any part of this broadcast or want to review the references cited, please go to my website at drkramata.com. Our number is 866-521-SHOW. If you have any questions that you want answered during the show or want to talk to me personally about any subject, including your most important asset, your own health. We'll be right back with our special guest, Dr. DeBold. Hi, this is Kimberly, and I adopted my two best friends, Benny and Tommy, from Tri-Valley Animal Rescue. Tommy's blind in one eye and can't hear, but he's perfectly fine to me. And Benny, well, he's like a big, soft teddy bear. So when you're ready to adopt an animal or even volunteer for a few hours, call Tri-Valley Animal Rescue in Dublin or go to PetFinder.com. They all deserve a second chance. Welcome back to the show. 
I am pleased to introduce our guest, Dr. Vicki DeBold. Dr. DeBold has a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing and a Ph.D. in health services policy and nursing from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. She currently serves on the Food and Drug Administration's Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. Um, She is also the co-founder and director of research at the Children's Health and Safety Research Foundation, in addition to serving as a director of patient safety for the National Vaccine Information Center. Uh, Dr. DeBold, I had to skip the other 22 pages of your CV because uh, we wanted to to get into some content here, but I, I wanted to let you know that we really, really appreciate you coming on to the show. Thank you. I, I'm 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 pleased to help. Now, how did our current vaccine schedules originate? Well, um, the the schedule is is something that continually is updated and unfolds as new uh, products are uh, developed and licensed and added to the um, national recommended schedule. Um, we began, um, you know, at least five decades ago with administration of uh, the DPT vaccine and then smallpox and then polio and then in the 60s started adding measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine to the schedule. So a- every year uh, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, through its Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, updates the recommended schedule. And then each uh, state uh, has its own process for determining what schedules go into uh, the mandatory vaccination schedule for that state. Uh, typically, it's, it's oriented around uh, children and entry into school or daycare or, you know, other types of uh, institutional settings. Now, how many vaccines are currently recommended? Well, um, there are there are a number uh, in the infant and adolescent schedule. There are, I believe, we're looking at fourteen, uh, at least fourteen vaccines, and I think more for girls um, with the addition of the new HPV vaccine. And we're looking at now um, somewhere between forty-eight and fifty-six. Uh, doses of uh, 14 to 16 vaccines by the time a child is an adolescent. Is there a difference between the United States vaccine recommendation schedule and those of other developed countries? Uh, Yeah, there is. Um, I think uh, the U.S. has one of the most, um, uh, how shall I put it, Um, yeah, uh, 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 for lack of a better word, aggressive vaccination schedules compared to other uh, developed countries. But uh, over time, most of the countries do put in um, the vaccines that are recommended for uh, for the U.S., uh, but they tend to lag behind um, the U.S. And there, there are differences not only in um, the specific types of vaccines recommended, but at the time periods and the administration schedule um, as well. Now, if, if, if in the U.S. we're more aggressive with vaccines, are, is the U.S. population getting an added, an added benefit in disease prevention, or is the ex, are the increased vaccines maybe somewhat excessive in terms of giving us a, uh, an added benefit? Well... That's an interesting question um, that I'm not sure that uh, is easy to answer. Um, there are there are different ways of looking at the effects of vaccines on health of a population, and one of them is just looking at the incidence of disease and uh, the change or decrease in mortality and morbidity uh, as it relates to the diseases that vaccines are intended to prevent. Um, the other side of the controversy has to do with um, the morbidity and mortality uh, due to associated conditions that are, are vaccine-related, the adverse events, um, the questions that are arising now um, about increases or differences in um, autoimmune and neurologic uh, illness um, too that that need to be considered. It's it's not it's not particularly easy to to sort this out. 
Uh, here in the U.S., we have a, a very high rate of uh, vaccination uh, compliance, and, uh, and, and this is particularly true when you look at uh, other developing and developed countries. So we have a, a particularly efficient system at um, vaccine uptake. Um, the question of whether that there are uh, problems that are associated with learning disabilities, asthma, autism, diabetes, and a host of other conditions that you know, some scientists believe are associated with um, taking vaccines at an early age is, is something that's you know, like I said, it's controversial, it's out on the table, and uh, it's being hotly debated. Now, is it appropriate for <clears throat> all people with every lifestyle to receive the same vaccine schedule? Uh, the The example that comes to mind is, for example, hepatitis B. Um, I think prostitutes, I think drug users, uh, the share needles perhaps should get it, but I question whether it would be appropriate for every live birth in the U.S. What is, what is your position on that? Well, this is something that uh, is, as, as you point out, something that is very hotly debated. And different countries have dealt with this in, in different ways. And while I'm not an expert on you know, comparative um, vaccine schedules, I know that some countries and some physicians here in the U.S. Uh, disagree that hepatitis B at birth for all uh, newborns is is warranted. Um, certainly, there are some uh, segments of the population um, that are at a greater risk of contracting hepatitis B at birth. Uh, probably need to be targeted differently than would all infants. Um, certainly, infants born to mothers who are hepatitis B positive, or perhaps um, you know have certain types of lifestyles. Um, you know, may suggest that those infants are at a greater need of that sort of vaccination than are, you know, the vast majority of children. Um, but um, from the perspective of a health care provider, it's, it's, it's rather difficult to sort some of that out. So uh, in, in one sense, it's easier uh, and more efficient just to vaccinate everyone the same way. But you raise, um, you know, an interesting um, question because it's not just hepatitis B that comes into play when you're talking about lifestyle uh, choices and differences in need. Um, he- hepatitis A is another example of a vaccine that is recommended, but it's not necessarily recommended for everyone to take. Um, so. And the same goes for adults who are traveling and so on. There are a number of licensed vaccines, such as yellow fever, that are not routinely given to everyone. Um, But if that you're traveling or you're going into a place where that disease is endemic, um, that may be a a vaccine that you may want to consider, um, whereas it's not, you know, something that every American would, would necessarily need. So uh, geography, travel habits are something that should be considered, uh, which you know makes perfect sense. Uh, in terms of making a decision for a child today, someone just has a child, goes to the pediatrician, are there other things they should consider when deciding whether to have you know, each and every vaccine? In other words, of the vaccines routinely offered, are there one or two that perhaps uh, can be excluded because of the controversy and potential risks as opposed to those that are so safe and so effective that people should not even consider not including them? Well, you've bundled a lot into that question, and there's there's two big pieces to, I think, the administration of vaccines that uh, consumers need to uh, take into account. And one piece is which vaccines do you take, and the other piece is when do you take them and how do you take them. Uh, so there is the, 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 the vaccine itself, and then there's the schedule, which are uh, they're related, but they, they really are separate issues. Um, you, you know, I mean, the, the issue about hepatitis B comes up quite a lot, and that is a vaccine that some uh, physicians and some parents have decided to postpone uh, administering to their children until that they are of the age um, where they may become sexually active or they may actually engage in 
um, IV drugs and or things, uh, other kinds of behaviors that would put them at high risk. So that is a vaccine that does uh, frequently get targeted as something that um, parents have uh, considered postponing, putting off. Um, the other part of the uh, uh, of the issue is, um, you know, when do you give um, the the other recommended vaccines, and do you give them all according to the schedule? And many parents, um, you know, that contact the National Vaccine Information Center about um, counseling for for this issue you know, have struggled with trying to develop a vaccination schedule that um, permits them to give um, the vaccines that for the diseases that are most likely to put an infant at risk and how can you um, spread those out over time and, you know, not compromise the efficacy of the vaccine. These are very difficult and tough questions. There's a couple of new books out. Well, the, Dr. Uh, DeBaldi, particular you're, you're... That, um, you know, starts to try to elucidate some of these issues. Well, you, you've certainly done a, a wonderful job in, in making it uh, give us a simple answer for a complex problem. We are up against a break, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes for more of Dr. DeBold. Ow! Uh, thank you for staying tuned. We are back with the Dr. Cremata Show and our guest, Dr. DeBold, who has a doctorate degree in public health and has a great deal of expertise in the topic of vaccinations. Uh, Dr. DeBold, welcome back. Now, thank you. should vaccines be given later when the immune system has had more time to develop or is it uh, important to give them, to give them as soon as possible? Well, that depends on who you ask. Um, they, the, the government and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that they be given according to the schedule. But um, infants aren't born with a fully mature immune system, which is why some of the vaccines are um, put into the schedule a little bit later. I'm not sure uh, if your audience knows of the vaccines that are recommended for children, but uh, at the 15-month well baby visit, which is how uh, the immunization schedule is organized around uh, the, the likely well baby visit, uh, these are the vaccines that are recommended, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, haemophilus, influenza B, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, pneumococcal, influenza, and hepatitis A. Uh, some parents have felt that, you know, that's just too much for a single office visit. So they are breaking um, these vaccines up and spreading them out. Um, and depending on which source you go to, you'll find different recommendations for uh, how to uh, prioritize these vaccines. Now, what are the, the links, uh, if any, between vaccines and developmental disorders such as autism or neurological diseases? Well, the the vaccine autism controversy is still alive. Um, there are, you know, key pieces of evidence, of scientific evidence that are just not there to come to final conclusions about that controversy. But there are a number of parents who, um, you know, claim that their children were healthy and normally developing until they got a series of vaccines, uh, typically the 15-month vaccine schedule that I just mentioned is the one where they will tell that their, their, their children were fine and then they developed a number of problems that eventually, you know, are diagnosed as autism. And you mentioned neurological problems. Autism is a neurological issue, as are a number of other um, uh, neurological problems that the Institute of Medicine, the CDC, and a number of other organizations you know, are, are aware that vaccines can cause some of these problems. So um, the issue of adverse events and uh, brain inflammation, convulsions, seizure disorders, um, things of that nature are not new uh, complications um, um, secondary to vaccines. 
Well, you know, I've had patients come into me and uh, with their children that were just vaccinated and say, boy, look at this reaction. He's been sleeping for a day and a half. He's been sick and not acting right. What's going on? And of course, I refer them back to their pediatricians and I say, you know, have them examined. And if it is a vaccine reaction, they someday often have a duty to report it so that we can keep track of these things and take care of your baby. Now, usually what happens is a pediatrician will just say, oh, that's not from the vaccine. And I guess my question for you is, are vaccine reactions commonly underreported? Vaccine reactions are definitely underreported. And um, they're, at best, probably 10% of them are reported. And some people think only as many as uh, 1% are reported. Um, providers that give vaccines are required by law to report reactions. They're not required to determine ahead of time whether or not the reaction that the child experienced within the first 30 days of vaccination is necessarily related to the vaccine or not. These are required to be reported to the uh, Federal Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. Uh, The National Vaccine Information Center also maintains a separate uh, reporting system that parents and others can report to as well. Uh, So there is a legal obligation on the part of uh, physicians and providers who give vaccines to report these reactions. This is a very important part of the uh, safety monitoring system in the U.S. Well, unfortunately, then, when a parent asks questions and the physician is telling them what the risks and benefits are and what the side effects are. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's difficult with all the underreporting for them to be getting any sort of uh, accurate information about that uh, because the risks are going to be reported as much lower or the side effects. Yeah. That, that's yeah, unfortunate. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And uh, the reporting does need to be improved. And we, we also need more uh, science that uh, tries to evaluate exactly you know, uh, who's at risk for suffering what type of adverse reaction and if there are things that we can do preventatively to, uh, you know, decrease the potential for children to experience adverse reactions that can include death. So um, it's very important to think that these get uh, reported um, because, as you said, without that we can't really understand what the risk and the benefits are. It's hard for Uh, parents to really engage in truly informed uh, consent and decision-making without that sort of information. Well, in in terms of using these vaccines, it seems that once we start one, uh, we sort of don't ever want to stop one. Now, the smallpox vaccine was discontinued many years ago, and smallpox didn't return. When is a disease considered eradicated, and how is the public health determination made to discontinue to, or to discontinue uh, vaccination? Well, there's probably a technical definition for when a disease is considered eradicated, how many years go by without a reported case. I'm not quite sure exactly what it is. But um, that, you know, it, that, that will come into play in determining whether or not a vaccine is taken off of the recommended schedule. To my knowledge, smallpox is the only vaccine that's been pulled off of uh, the U.S. schedule because of that. Um, but it's um, so far, uh, I know there have been concerted efforts to try to eradicate polio. That has not occurred yet. Um, there are a lot of complicated issues with polio vaccine and um, vaccination and the contraction of vaccine strain polio versus wild strain polio. It's an issue that is still uh, very salient, particularly in Africa and other developing parts of the world. Now, prior to the to the development of vaccinations, um, how were plagues and other diseases historically? What made them disappear? Because we just we didn't have vaccines to protect the public. Well, you know, uh, diseases tend to be cyclical, and so you will see, you know, uh, increases and then decreases in disease is just part of sort of the natural cycle of the disease, and then other factors come into play in determining the 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 length of the cycle and also uh, the severity of illness that's associated with particular cycles. Um, we know that improvements in hygiene, nutrition, um, and certain types of medical care that prevented pneumonia-related and um, to some of these diseases has greatly contributed to 
uh, decrease in the incidence of disease as well as the morbidity and mortality associated with it. So these, all these factors make it um, somewhat difficult, I think, to actually isolate the effect of vaccines on, um, on transmission, contagion, and the effects of, of these um, diseases. Now, is there anything to the arguments put forward by people like uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who say the drug companies essentially manipulate the government into creating mandates to guarantee a market for their drugs, or is that uh, somewhat of a conspiracy theory? Well, I, 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 I'd be careful about putting it sort of in those sorts of terms. Uh, the government uh, and the pharmaceutical industry and the medical community are all actively working to develop uh, vaccines for a number of different conditions. Um, I think there are several thousand uh, clinical trials going on right now. And um, the government does, uh, because that um, the government plays a key role in uh, the consumption and uptake of vaccines, there, there is, um, there are relationships there that are complex, and they do need to, you know, to be clearly understood to understand the, you know, the political and the historical and the economic underpinnings of the of vaccine industry. But um, there are collaborative relationships uh, amongst these uh, three parties that 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 fully. Uh, I think, come into play in terms of understanding, you know, why that the U.S. has the schedule that it has. That's uh, that's very helpful. Um, 30 seconds, last question. If you had children today, and you know, infants, and lived in the United States, would you vaccinate your children with all of the recommended vaccines and at the recommended timetables? Well, great question. And anybody who um, has a young child, the, the most important thing to do is to read and educate yourself. And I would, I recommend that parents read broadly, um, you know, sit down and take a look at the uh, familial and genetic risk factors, previous uh, experiences with vaccines, and um, work with one or more healthcare practitioners to make decisions that fit for your family. Uh, Dr. Uh, DeBold, you have been uh, extremely helpful in getting this information to our listeners, and I certainly appreciate you being available, and I'm sure that uh, my listeners do as well. Uh, thank you for your, very much for your time and for being here with us on the Dr. Cremata Show. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Hi, this is Kimberly, and I adopted my two best friends, Benny and Tommy, from Tri-Valley Animal Rescue. Tommy's blind in one eye and can't hear, but he's perfectly fine to me. And Benny, well, he's like a big, soft teddy bear. So when you're ready to adopt an animal or even volunteer for a few hours, call Tri-Valley Animal Rescue in Dublin or go to PetFinder.com. They all deserve a second chance. Welcome back to KNEW, the best talk radio station in the Bay Area at 910 on your AM dial. I hope that you found Dr. DeBold's information about vaccines as interesting as I did. We now go to our anti-aging segment. We'll answer some emails in our mailbag, look at an article on lifestyle and disease, and offer a health tip to practice for the week. Let's look at some age and fitness-related studies. In the British Medical Journal, this is the June 2008 edition, researchers looked at the association between muscular strength and death in men. Now, the, this is a study of 8,700 men between the ages of 20 and 80, so it's a pretty good representation. And they basically found that muscular strength increased the protection offered from aerobic exercise and overall cardiovascular health. So even adjusting for cardiovascular health and uh, other variables, increased muscle, muscular strength reduced all causes of death and cancer in men. This was true for overweight and normal weight men. So bottom line, I would like to see you include strength training in your exercise routine to stay strong and maintain 
your increase or increase your functional capacities. You won't only look better at the beach, but the increased strength will decrease your chances of dying and from getting cancer. Let's move over to our medical myth section. Uh, since there's so many health-related warnings going around the Internet on a regular basis these days, uh, I'm going to start addressing some of these in this uh, medical myth section. Some of them are valid, but I find that most are not. Most of these myths cite an anonymous reference, but even the ones that list a respected source, such as one that listed uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital, often proved false as well. Some of these myths are based in truth, but are then exaggerated to the point that they can even become dangerous, like I read about one where they injected hydro uh, hydrogen peroxide to cure cancer. The first Internet hoax that I'll be covering is the claim that eating shrimp after you have just taken vitamin C pills will cause you to die of arsenic poison within hours. Well, just on the face of this, yes, it's preposterous. Uh, with millions of people taking vitamin C on a regular basis, millions eating shrimp on a regular basis, if this were true, people would be dying of arsenic poisoning all around us. And we'd certainly have heard about it from sources other than the anonymous emails such as the nightly news. So how did this rumor start? The claim that vitamin C turns a chemical found in shrimp into arsenic. Well, first of all, arsenic is a basic element, so it's not formed by combining other compounds. It is true that there are certain aquatic organisms, but not shrimp, that can metabolize arsenic, but only to a form that is non-toxic to humans. How one gets from this fact to the shrimp vitamin C claim uh, causing death certainly makes no sense to me, and there's no th truth to it whatsoever. In fact, I would recommend that you take some extra vitamin C with your shrimp cocktail. It would probably do you good. And if I'm wrong and they are right about this combination killing you, I likely will not be hearing from you complaining about my recommendation. Let's uh, move over to our mailbag. Marv from Newark asks, You keep stressing on your show the importance of taking vitamins and minerals, but they make me nauseated. <laughs> Any suggestions? Uh, yes, I do, Marv. Um, I want to thank you for asking the question since this is really a pretty common complaint. Now, the most common cause of nausea from supplements is when you take minerals, and especially high doses of zinc or iron on an empty stomach. Although some people might be sensitive to other things as well, this is certainly the most common. Remember that vitamins, minerals, probiotics, omega-3s, coenzyme Q, and all of these other helpful substances that you'll find in the supplement that I recommend and other available supplements are part of foods. In fact, the supplement that I recommend and is available on my website at drcremata.com has whole fruit and vegetable concentrates in it. So it actually has food in it. So if you always take your nutritional supplements with food, you'll likely eliminate the nausea that you've been getting after taking these nutritional supplements. The next one from the mailbag is Kim from Alameda. She says, I have carpal tunnel syndrome and my doctor wants to do surgery. I really don't want surgery. Can chiropractic help with this? Well, uh, Kim, actually many times we can. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome occurs when a small tunnel in the wrist gets occluded and the nerves that go into the thumb and the first two fingers get pinched. It's called the, the median nerve. Sometimes a nerve can be pinched with too much fluid, like fluid retention or edema in the, tuttle, in the tunnel, and this happens with uh, low thyroid function and with pregnancy. But more commonly, carpal tunnel syndrome sufferers just have chronic inflammation in the tunnel that pinches the nerve. There's good scientific support showing that wrist and neck adjustments, vitamin B6, wrist splints, and some natural anti-inflammatories like omega-3s can correct many of these cases of carpal tunnel syndrome without surgery. Let's go to our nutrition segment. We have some really, really important stuff here. I want you to listen very carefully. In the Journal of Applied Physiology, researchers reviewed 424 scientific studies looking at the following. Number one, does exercise and diet prevent chronic diseases such as cancer, heart disease, and diabetes? Number two, can lifestyle changes reverse existing disease and, and prevent disease? And number three, if so, how does exercise and diet do this? Well, they came up with some interesting conclusions. And again, listen carefully. This should motivate you, uh, if, if other things don't, to, to really think about changing your lifestyle. 70% of deaths in America are from cancer and diabetes. 60% of us are overweight. Now, their data showed from all of these studies that the lack of physical activity and poor diet caused 
400,000 deaths in the year 2000, ranking second as the leading cause of death right behind tobacco. It is estimated that lifestyle, poor diet, and exercise will soon be the number one cause of death in this country. So they state the war on chronic disease is on. Now listen carefully. They state that the lifestyle of our children is key to the future health and the related health care costs in our country. So they're saying we need to look at the children. Modifying the lifestyle of children is critical to reducing chronic disease risk. Most children eat too much fat, sugar, fast food, soft drinks, high-calorie fruit juices, and this is clearly and definitively linked to future metabolic diseases. Children are performing less activity as computers, televisions, and video games are becoming more popular and just continuing their physical education programs. So bottom line here from this 454 paper review is encouraging, and those of us that are parents know what that, that word really means, forcing them to have healthy diets and more activity uh, you know, for our nation's children is critical to winning the war on chronic diseases. This isn't about the adults that start worrying about it. It's about children developing their lifestyle and maintaining the lifestyle throughout adulthood. If you want a little insurance for your kids, at least be sure that they are taking a high potency and complete nutritional supplement. The best value for a comprehensive supplement with omega-3s, probiotics, vitamins, minerals, fruit and vegetable concentrates, all these things that we keep stressing um, for your optimal health are available at the Diet Supplementation tab on my website at drkramata.com. You can't be with your kids 24 hours of every day to help them or, like I said, to force them to eat right, but you can at least be sure that they get essential nutrients by having them take one packet of these high-quality and high-potency supplements every day. In a related article about children and lifestyle, here's some here's some practical a practical application of at least the activity and the exercise part. In the August 2008 issue of the American Chiropractor, there are, there's some practical advice for exercising children. Here's the summary. Just kind of keep this summary in mind so you can get something going for your children or your grandchildren. Frequency, number one, three times a week. You have to do this a few times a week. Once a week on the weekend isn't going to do it. Intensity has to be moderate. They need to perspire. They need to make sure that they feel it. It can't be just a, you know, a minor little exercise that they don't feel. Duration, 30 to 40 minutes. You need to block out and prioritize about 45 minutes for this exercise. There should be a warm-up. Eight to ten minutes, do things like brisk walking, skipping, light jogging, jumping, something that, that gets them moving, and aerobic activity. For kids, walking, cycling, swimming, jogging, this is where it's important to start with maybe five or ten minutes at a time and increase to about a half hour. And for cooling down, probably the best thing to do is uh, stretching. For the next week, here's a health tip to follow. The, this health tip is actually quite useful and is no laughing matter. We all know that laughing makes us feel better, but it does much more than that. Researchers have found that laughing increases your immune system response, lowers your blood sugar in diabetics, increases oxygen flow, and induces relaxation for a better night's sleep. So, Go rent your favorite comedy, get together with your friends, just not your morose ones. Do whatever it is that makes you laugh. For one, and a critically important health benefit, you'll sleep better tonight. Well, that is the end of our show for today. I hope you enjoyed listening to Dr. DeBold, and please stress the importance of lifestyle for children as well as adults. The best quality insurance to be sure that you're getting critically important nutritional supplements important for children and adults can be purchased on my website at drcremata.com by clicking on the diet supplementation tab. If you missed any part of this show or wish to share this information with friends and family, please refer them to my website at drcremata.com where they can access the podcasts and references for these shows by clicking on the radio show tab. If you have any questions that you would like answered on the show or you would like a second opinion regarding your particular health problem, you can call me personally at 866-521-SHOW or click on the email tab on my website. Thank you for listening.